Hi, I'm Raphael. Thank you for being here. And I wanted to start off with a poem. Because I'm so into the internet, and it's nice to see what people think of you on the internet. Maybe you know this series called Vice Art Talk, and they made a little profile on me. And these were the most interesting comments. So the poem is called YouTube Comments. Please stop and go get a job. You are annoying. <laughs> Fuck this asshole. This ha guy can hardly explain his own ideas. He's honest. Lazy art. I want to do that. What a load of fucking shite. <laughs> what the fuck? How does he make a living off that? What a joke. My buddy's toddler has more artistic talent. I sincerely hope people don't support this pathetic excuse for an artist. Shitty haircut. <laughs> what a waste of both resources and time. Just took a shit. Is that art? <laughs> Artsy fartsy unemployedy. <laughs> this guy has smoked himself retarded. If this is your life, then your life is shit. <laughs> cool story, bro. Tell it again. So, um, yeah, it, it, that was always my approach. I, I didn't like the stuffy art world, and I saw this opportunity with internet, and I think you can do whatever you want, and you don't have to deal with uh, the assholes. So really, at the heart of my my practice was, I mean, I discovered the internet and immediately the first thing you do is you try to find things that interest you. I was 16 and I was interested in comic books and punk music, so you find stuff and you see, oh, there's lyrics and there's interviews with comic artists that you like. But then you start thinking, is there anything here that happens on the internet that you couldn't find in a record store and that you couldn't see on TV? So I found a few things and I started thinking, what can I make? I didn't want to make a, a website that is a portfolio of stuff that happens elsewhere. So yeah, this is the canvas. That's always what, if people tell me what do you do, I say I'm an artist who uses the internet as his canvas. And so over the years I just started making them and surprisingly quickly I got a large audience, so that was one of the things that was very stimulating. And my first hit, I started to get a lot of traffic. Uh, this was very fun to make. Um, yeah, you could... Uh, Someone just interviewed me recently and they asked me, do you have any regrets in life? I don't regret making this. I regret uh, when iPhone apps came out, I should have immediately, this is from 2001, and I should have made a fart app because the first few fart apps made millions and I missed out on that. So. <laughs> That's my big regret. Um, it was interesting before when he was talking about um, the Guardian and making things that work across devices and different compositions. Uh, uh, kind of a detail, maybe you already noticed, this is isometric, so things in the back are just as big as things in the front, so the money can keep growing, it can keep coming closer to you, but you're never, uh, you're never covered by it. If there was perspective, it would blow up, and at some point it would just be green. Um, but a painter or any artist usually works with a fixed canvas. So uh, maybe you want to make a square painting or a round painting or a triangle or whatever, and then you make a composition. But everybody's screen is different, and people put their browsers in different ways. So from the beginning, I had to think about composition in a different way. And that's one theme that's been running through my work. This is an early example, but here... I'm just going back and forth. It's uh, all over the place. This is a very recent work. But the user, you have to understand this is interactive. I'm moving the mouse. And then uh, you keep making new compositions. Maybe this is something that designers relate to when you're building a grid for a website. Uh, it's kind of that, but then without all the stuff that comes after. Um, 
So first, that's what I, I forgot the introduction. Um, first, I'm just showing a bunch of websites, and then I'm going to talk about how these websites live in the world and how we go outside of the screen. But, so first, I'm just going to show a few websites. I won't tell you too much. The thing with the computer is that it's easy, of course, to upload a photo and a video, but I wanted to make things that are specific to a computer that, I don't know how to exactly explain it, but making things in lines and making things that are programmable and making things that pass easy through a modem, I just wanted to make something specific to this medium. So if you want to show something that's really hot and feels like it's exploding, then you could either film a volcano or you use fast flickering colors that respond to your touch, so it kind of feels like you're contributing. And this is another abstraction of, a, of an explosion. So if you move to the center, it slows down. So each work is in its own domain name. This is hybridmoment.com, and that was a decision. It's interesting, I'm, uh, this is a design conference, and it was interesting when I started, most designers had an experiment section on their website. They don't do that anymore, but they would have a bunch of JavaScript or Flash experiments, and stuff like that. But they always just felt like tryouts, like files, and I decided I want to put it in a domain name because it frames it. It's, it's, it's not just a file. I'm not, I invested in a domain name, and so you can always find it there. And then later I realized that that would also make it a sellable thing. So um, this way I can create moving images freely, and when the collector buys them, they own the domain name. It's transferred to them, and then the name of the collector is mentioned here in the title. Because I, I, I'm... I thought it was very strange. I spoke to a gallerist in New York, and she was talking about the early 80s. They started making video art, and they had to make a decision. How do we sell this? Do we start a video store, and you can rent art videos with all the galleries together, and we'll have a little shop in Chelsea? And, but that didn't work, because maybe there's only 1,000 people interested, and they'll each pay $3, and you make 3,000 bucks. That's, so they went with the model the kind of taking it from photography. We make five really expensive copies, and different collectors buy those copies, and they keep it in a vault, and no one else can see it. And that, to me, sounds almost like the Rolling Stones, when they wrote the song Satisfaction, they're like, no, let's just sell five copies. We don't want to share it with the world. It, it's completely absurd to me that this, this system exists. So that's why I chose distributing everything freely online and making it ownable to collectors. Is there a timer? How far am I? Okay. Uh, this is a Dutch landscape. I don't know, Holland is maybe the flattest country in the world. <laughs> I, I really love it when I make stuff that is not intended to be funny and people laugh. It's, it's completely weird to me. It's like I could tell you, like, oh, my plane arrived late, and then people are laughing. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I grew up riding trains, and I think that's a big part of it. I always like looking at moving things and kind of staring at a waterfall or a fountain. So I'm interested in these things that don't have a beginning or an end, but they're always moving. And uh, that's another thing that's confusing to people. They, gallerists often say, yeah, we'll sell your videos, and I have to tell them it's not a video. Yeah, yeah, but it's an anime. No, it, it's, it's a computer-generated image, and then it just gets too complicated. But it's random, so the, the, the composition changes all the time within the, the limits that I set. I don't code it myself, by the way. But, uh, um, this is a maze. So, you just keep walking around, and every time you turn around, the maze changes. So right now you're staring at a red square, and then we go left and left. And now it's green. So yeah, you'll never find a way out.
Um, yeah, this came to me in a dream, actually. I don't know what f flying... There's a lot of different meanings people attach to flying in dreams. I like it when I'm flying in dreams. So I thought of a museum that's truly three-dimensional, usually just moving on a floor and then going up with the elevator. But here I imagined... I've always tried to make things that are, it's not funny. Um, <laughs> but I've always tried to make things that are not local in time or space. So you're not sure when it was made and you're not sure where it was made. I don't want to make things about New York or about where I grew up or whatever. I, I wanted to appeal, a, a possible appeal to as many people as possible. Um, so that's why I isolate things very much. I remove the context and just focus on it focus very much, that's what I'm trying to do, which is kind of contrary to the internet, I guess. Um, this is the flower that keeps on opening. Okay, so everything's available on uh, newrafael.com. Let's look at this one. And um, so you can see everything. You can see the rest. And uh, now we'll switch to exhibitions and things that I do beyond the computer. Because really the thing for me is, and I think everybody spoke about this, um, is the, this idea of creative freedom. And I, I really think with the internet, we have this awesome freedom that never existed before. Uh, so that's really, that was the basis of it, just making things because you want to, not because someone else said. And, and the, the thing I really love about the internet compared to anything else, compared to publishing, compared to TV, compared to... There's no committee whatsoever. Even, you know, when a gallery asks you, you start thinking a bit too much. You're like, oh, well... It... On the internet, you don't care. If it's a fart or if it's pink next to blue or whatever you want to do, you just do it. And, uh... and the internet is also kind of forgiving. I feel that if you make a mistake, it's okay. And in a gallery, people are like, oh, he lost his touch. And, uh... Um, okay, so I'm wearing a shirt that is based on this website. Broken Self. Uh, well, this is the shirt. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a simple idea. And um, friends of mine asked me, they wanted to do a sculpture show with internet artists. They wanted internet artists to think in a different way. And so I made, I came up with the idea of broken bottles in a gallery. kind of using the black and white and the breaking and sort of thinking about interaction in the gallery. Um, another example. So it, it, when I first started exhibiting my works, I just projected them and when you repeat them, interesting things happen, but then Quickly, I started to think about what this first show started. I wanted the entire gallery surface to be reflective because I thought my medium is moving light, and if the floor is reflective, I double the amount of moving light. Um, we couldn't do the whole floor, so we ended up just getting spare mirrors from different parts, and then I actually liked that it created a weird composition in the space, and it just sort of you're not even, the, the composition is kind of at the mercy of what you get and the materials you have. And this was the other angle. The, the exhibition was made, it, it was a, the room has four doors, but you weren't allowed to enter, and so each 
angle, you would see a different part of the exhibition. You couldn't see the whole exhibition at once. Um, here there's two mirrors next to each other, so you, you get this infinite repeat. And here was the, we, I was gonna do a show filled with mirrors, but then I just kept them on the, they, they delivered them like that in the corner, and then I thought, oh, that looks interesting. It started doing things I didn't predict. So that's really a nice thing at exhibitions that there's these weird accidents. And it's hard to, that's the, this is the key thing for me that frustrates me about exhibitions. It's like when you walk in front of that mirror, you see the image reflected in different ways and it's difficult for your eyes, but you can't tell that from the photo. So that's really the core why I chose the internet as my medium. Um, so you know, when I show the websites, I'm not showing documentation, I'm showing the actual work but this is a, a shadow of what the, the real thing is. And an ongoing theme with the mirrors, these are mirrors organized by size, the size of computer screens. So they go from a, a plasma screen all the way down to the iPhone. Uh, more mirror experiments. Yeah, at some point one broke and it turned out to be great and I started breaking more of them. Here we, filled the whole floor, and, uh, and that's another thing that, um, I, th I don't know if any of you guys here are media artists or exhibit computer work, but a lot of times in exhibitions you have a screen on the wall, and you know when you're in front of the computer you forget that you're looking at a computer, you're just in it, you're completely in that dream world. But then when you see computers in exhibition spaces, all of a sudden the logo is there, and the and the frame is there, all those things you don't notice at home when you're watching TV. So that's the thing that I'm trying to do here is let the, let the internet or let the juice or let the spirit escape the machine. It's just all around you and you forget that you're looking at devices, which hopefully is the future of computing. I, I hope it's not trapped in devices anymore. Um, here is again the, the broken mirror floor and interactive projections. Um, and this all came from compositional studies. It's funny because I make all these internet works, but then sometimes I'm thinking I'm retarded. Why would you spend so much time on the internet? So I started making drawings. I said, I should make paintings. Maybe that's way better. So I started thinking, what can you do with, in composition with painting that hasn't been done? But then it became a website. So. Um, but this is, the idea here is that someone, a user, is deciding the, the composition, which you can't do in painting. So you're dividing the screen. You can also go back and make it. And this is one thing I would advise anyone that I discovered. I was very scared about repeating myself when I was younger. I thought that's a bad thing. So then I made a variation. I was like, should I do that? But I did. and. Uh, this one is okay, I'm not as charmed by it as the other one, but I'm glad I made it, it was like a little step, and then I made this one, which then everybody was so happy about. It's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is an ongoing theme in my work, the, the user composing the image. And then this became a TV ad. I, it's funny, I never looked for clients. I just, I preferred to do other stuff. I worked in construction and I don't know what, I did weird jobs. But ad agencies always liked my work. And I'm not sure, I think they were just trying to find out what to do with this weird new medium. Um, so I was in a lot of mood boards and I would always get emails saying, oh, we want to do a campaign around you. It usually doesn't happen, but then uh, Vice actually contacted me to do an art car. So Ford asked me, they asked different artists to make an art project, and I was interested because there's whole, this whole tradition of art cars where they usually ask a painter to do something, and you, you'll have an Andy Warhol car and a Roy Lichtenstein car and a Jeff Koons car, but these are all still images, and I thought... Let's spray paint the car completely white and then project on it and 
I'll make the compositions on site. So that's right. Uh, that's the car. And it, the interesting thing for me was I'd never projected on a three-dimensional object before. And it was a really weird experience standing there. You, you, you think you're seeing CG right in front of you. But it's just, I, I don't mean this image looks like CG for sure. But also in reality, it looked kind of fake. But it's just a white car with four pro projectors on it. And that's it. There's a little bit of color balance. But nothing else is photoshopped. And it was also interesting. We had four computers there with, with the work, and I was playing with the lines, so I'm thinking one line should cover the window in that direction, one line should cut the wheel in half, and the car becomes a screen, which was the whole idea for me. And it's not a flat screen, it's a three-dimensional object. So you're moving your mouse kind of in a, on a weird three-dimensional object. And so what's interesting now is that this car is going to be exhibited in the Netherlands as in art context. So it's interesting for me that then the visitors will be able to paint the car with this virtual angular paint. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm happy that it seems that advertisers aren't able to reach people in the old ways, and it seems that the newer ways are more interesting. So now uh, I'm approached by brands to do stuff completely in freedom. That's kind of the best of both worlds, because you, you get this huge audience as well. Uh, this is the TV ad. The 24-hour Fiesta project. This is what Raphael did. Twenty-four hours with the new Ford Fiesta with revolutionary EcoBoost engine technology. What would you do? Yeah, it, it was funny that we, we took the photos first and Vice Magazine was curating it, so they were kind of the middleman between me and Ford. And then in, in the end, the TV ad, it started just with the stills and it would be magazine ads, but they liked the moving images as well, so they made this TV ad and Vice was all like, oh, we're so embarrassed about the TV ad, it's really cheesy, but I loved it. I, don't, I, I thought it was... <laughs> um, Here's another translation of a web piece to the real world. And the thing is, I, I, for me, there's no answers or rules. I'm not saying uh, an internet project should always be translated or it should just be exhibited on a screen. I think every time you can think in a new way. But uh, I'm very proud of this piece because it took about 10 minutes to make. Um, so the domain name is Nosquito. So it's a tiny idea, but people, it's nice to see when people respond. And then I was asked by a curator, um, some curators say, let's do a mirror show. And, OK, and we, we do it a little different every time. This guy is like, no, I don't want a straight, just a visual translation. I want something more complex, something a bit more challenging. So we came up with the idea, uh, wait. It, the space was huge, maybe the size of this room, but square. And I had the idea, let's make the room completely black, and only one visitor can go in at this. Uh, and you're just in total darkness. And most people didn't even know the room was that big. So they're walking like this. And when they're walking, you hear the sound of a mosquito. And when they're standing still, it's just it's like, and then, So and then we started investigating, how do we do that? And, we tried with my programmer, we used the Kinect, but it turned out the room was kind of complicated with pillars, and there's dust flying around, and it's so dark, and et cetera. So then I thought of the idea, which I don't know if Nick Roop is here right now, but I stole the idea from him. But um, I, I said, why don't we just put one security cam, or three security cams, and we put an intern in the back, and they press pause and play when the person is moving. <laughs> <laughs> so. That turned out to be way cheaper than uh, building it. <laughs> uh, 
But the, the, the process of this type of stuff is really funny. It was a time of cultural budget cuts in Holland. And so there's a lot of committees saying, so well, where is this money going? And the curator was in the middle of these kind of fights with the city. And so I told him the idea. And he just looked at me and said, oh, no, I'm going to have to explain this. Like, uh, no. Uh, another aspect, just to show you a little bit about composition. So yeah, as, as designers have noticed before, it's, it's really difficult making a website. How big is a website? Nobody knows. That was one of the questions when we started in school working with computers. It's like, I want to make a website. Should it be 800 pixels big? It's, nobody knows. A website can be any size. So um, this landscape, for example, it scales non-proportionally. For me, it worked OK like that. That, that was one choice. And the dollar bills get cropped. And this is a work that it really adjusts to the screen and recomposes itself. So. This is a, an abstraction of uh, human digestion. I really think humans are just a tube of things going in and going out. And I think. Whenever things go in or out, it's really enjoyable. <laughs> um, but so when you think about composition in this sort of way of it's very flexible and it can be on any scale, I was very happy. I was invited in Seoul to show the works on the biggest screen in Asia. And that's really what I always wanted. I thought a website should adjust itself to whatever screen there is. And then this screen is 23 stories high. So yeah, that was uh, super cool. So we showed different works. OK. And then, um, then there's this new screen, the mobile screen. So I had to think about that a little bit. And the mobile is, of course, it's much smaller, so the visual experience is not as strong. And I, I made two apps of, for example, that explosion is here. Uh, yeah, it's funny seeing these ne next to each other. But yeah, it's the same explosion. And it, it, it was OK. It works nice, and you can carry it with you. That's cool. But then I thought maybe it would be more interesting to play with this physical aspect. So I came up with Finger Battle, which uh, I call the simplest game in the universe. OK, and then uh, the, a friend of mine said we should always end with a call to action. How many minutes are we in? Yeah, so uh, I started an exhibition format called BYOB. Uh, in Germany and Holland, we use the word Beamer for projector. And BYOB means bring your own booze. So I noticed that exhibiting is a lot of work. Making exhibitions is a lot of work. And the, the practical side is very difficult. and you have to deal with egos and press releases and budgets and all this stuff. I also noticed, I was living in Berlin, most of my friends make moving images, and most of them own projectors. Uh, they experiment at home because they exhibit with projectors, so they try different things. So I thought, let's just invite all our friends, and everybody brings a projector and takes care of their own stuff. And so it's kind of this internet ethos uh, that you just take care of your own stuff, but collectively things can grow. And we had a space uh, together with a friend. We organized the first one. And immediately I told everyone, they said, where should I set up? I, said, I don't know. Where's the electricity? I don't know. 
uh, should I do the, which work should I show? I don't just do whatever you want. So the first BYOB is this one uh, in Berlin, and it was just it was re I was surprised how fun it was and how easy it was. The mood was really nice, and people were very friendly and collaborative. And they're like, oh, maybe my work should move over there. Maybe it should move over there. Oh, you're showing something. I have something that relates to it. So it just becomes this organic living thing. And people were super happy. It's just, I remember it being, because a lot of exhibitions are kind of, I don't know, it, you guys are more in the design world, I guess, but there's a lot of frustration and uh, people are like, oh, my work doesn't look good next to that one. And, uh, this is just happiness. And we did the first one in Berlin and then we did one in New York. And after that, it kind of really exploded within two and a half years, there's been 150 editions. Uh, and you can start one yourself. The, the rules are simple. Um, it reads, uh, find a space, invite many artists, and ask them to bring their projectors. <laughs> so that's all you need to do. Um, and I was really happy to see it happening in unconventional places. The, the first one was Berlin, which is a city full of artists, and, and New York, and Paris, stuff like that. But then it started happening in Spain, and then it happened in Jerusalem and in Greece, and there was one in Burma, and then it happened in New Zealand and in Korea, and people just really feel empowered. And I think that's the same thing, that's the message everybody here is trying to say, is just do stuff on your own, and it's very fulfilling. So I'll show you a little compilation of BYB New York and Tokyo together, and I guess that's the end. Okay, that's a weird ending. Okay, <laughs> that was it. Thank you.